It's Neil Patwari. In this segment, I'm going to talk about how OFDM got its FFT. In the last segment, I talked about the subcarriers of OFDM. Now, each one has two basis functions. We're going to call them C and S. At the kth uh, subcarrier, we've got a square root of 2 over T sub S times a cosine at a mega naught plus the 2 pi times k times delta ft, and a sine at the same frequency. These are defined between 0 and t sub s, and 0 otherwise. So in the time domain, um, what happens when we modulate this with some kind of quam symbol? It is we pick amplitudes based on some quam modulation for each of the cosine and the sine basis functions. We're going to get something like this, and I'm going to write it as x k of t to denote the signal produced on the kth subcarrier. It's going to be some amplitude multiplied by the cosine and some amplitude multiplied by the sine. We're going to have the square root of 2 over t sub s brought out front, multiplied by some amplitude, I'm going to call it a sub k comma i, times a cosine at the kth carrier frequency, plus an amplitude k comma q for the quadrature, multiplied by the sine at that same frequency. Whatever these amplitudes are would be picked for the particular symbol that we've decided to send. And the OFDM signal for this symbol is going to be the sum of all of these subcarriers. So for k equal to 0 to capital B minus 1, that is the number of subcarriers, we're going to have x of t at each of these added together. And instead of writing that all out exactly as I wrote it in the equation above, I'm going to write this as follows. I'm going to pull out the square root of 2 over t sub s again and I'm going to use the complex baseband notation that we've used before to bring in this sum. When I write this in this form with the real part of a complex value, I'm going to multiply this e k i with the e to the j omega naught plus 2 pi k delta f t. By the a k i, the real operator is going to pull out the cosine uh, multiplied by that amplitude and the real part of the j times the a sub k comma q of the same complex exponential is going to pull out the minus times the a k q, um, and I should make this a minus sign. That's going to get us this part of the real valued time domain signal. And I can even make this more explicit and match the complex baseband form that we've used by pulling out an e to the j omega naught t out front and then having this sum. And this delta f is 1 over t sub s. So what I can do actually is make that a t divided by t sub s. And here this a of k is this complex value that represents the symbol on the k subcarrier. This expression here looks very much like the inverse discrete Fourier transform. Just to remind you, we have this formula x of n in the inverse discrete Fourier transform is written with this formula. And if I were to replace uh, the x of k with a sub k, or a of k, and I were to replace the n with b, and we were to take this n and realize that it's what we're talking about here is time, little t, and in fact the little n divided by capital N here in this complex exponential is the same as what we're talking about is time divided by a symbol period. This is a, the fraction of the time through the symbol that we are. So if we make these replacements, we're exactly up here at this formula that we have for the transmitted signal at time little t.
So what we end up with is a complex baseband signal that can be calculated from the inverse discrete Fourier transform. Okay, so that would mean that at the receiver, we could use the discrete Fourier transform to undo this inverse DFT operation and give us the amplitudes that we want to know that contained our data. But the problem is that computing the DFT is hard. And lots of computational exponentials need to be calculated. We need to multiply and add them to other complex values. So you can see there's going to be a lot of uh, floating point calculations that are difficult to do in a, in a computationally efficient real-time processor. So what we do instead is use the FFT, the fast Fourier transform. The fast Fourier transform, if you recall, is only allowed to be used on periodic signals. And our communication signals are not periodic signals. We're going to send different symbols at each symbol period. That's the whole point. So what we do here is we kind of use the FFT to approximate the DFT and the IFFT to approximate the inverse discrete Fourier transform. And we do this by copy and pasting the end of our symbol back to the beginning of our signal. So let's say that our signal looks like this over time, and this is uh, the time axis. What we're going to do is we're going to cut out this part of the signal, and we're going to paste it back to the beginning of the signal. And this period of time becomes our cyclic prefix. I know that's redundant, and I've already sent it at the end. Why am I bothering to send it at the beginning again? Well, it's a trade-off here. We're allowing the signal to contain some redundancy so that the FFT is closer to what the discrete Fourier transform is, so that we have a somewhat periodic signal that then the FFT becomes approximately the right answer for the DFT. The amount of time that we we spend sending the cyclic prefix will be part of the protocol, so we'll agree on that ahead of time. We can just throw it out at the receiver when we're done taking the Fourier transform. And it becomes a little bit of waste, but again, it's necessary to allow us to use the FFT. And another lazy thing that we do to make our lives easier is that we reserve a small number of subcarriers as pilot tones. That is, we don't modulate them. That is, if we've got these uh, subcarriers from 0 to B minus 1, we might, instead of sending modulated uh, square waves, we might just send a cosine uh, in one of those subcarriers, maybe uh, a cosine and another one, that then, instead of being modulated, don't have any information on them. But those unmodulated pilot tones, as we call them, allow the receiver to have an easier time at synchronizing its clock to the frequency and phase of the signal that was being sent. Again, this trades a little bit of bandwidth for an easier implementation. So this is how we allow OFDM to use the FFT. We trade off a little bit of signal bandwidth for the pilot tones. We trade off a little bit of time to enable the cyclic prefix in order to make the FFT implementation of the OFDM work reliably and computationally efficiently. And that computational efficiency has made OFDM a very popular modulation for a wide variety of communication protocols.